Big rigs regularly roll into this truck stop to fuel up in Sacramento. I love trucking. Including Roger Gibson, who is on his way to drop off some cargo in the Bay Area. 15, 20 minutes. Depends on the fuel station. Gibson and other truckers are bracing for a California rule starting next week, which bans the use of big trucks and buses with engines made before 2010. You're killing us. We have, uh, we have families at home, too. We got to make a living. And there's a lot of brothers out there I know that own their own trucks. And... It's fight. The rule is part of a set of clean air regulations the state's Air Resources Board passed in 2008. Then Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger gave it the green light. I think that we should move forward with this whole thing, but I understand the business's concern, believe me. The Air Resources Board has said 2010 and newer model engines do a better job of filtering out harmful particulate matter. We as an association uh, are seeing members drop because of this this rule. They've just simply decided that uh, they're not going to go out and spend $150,000 on a truck that could lead them to bankruptcy. Trucks help move goods across the state and country from food to cars and other necessities of everyday life. Trucking groups note the new rule makes about 70,000 semis, or more than 10% of California's commercial motor vehicle population, illegal. You can't take that big a percentage of the vehicles off the road. Uh, but with the slowdown in the economy, you know, it remains to be seen uh, what the impact will be. That impact expected to be felt most by smaller and medium-sized trucking businesses as the state prioritizes air quality and public health. Now, the Air Resources Board says that any vehicle owners having issues complying with the rule should reach out to the agency. In the meantime, the state will deny registration for the vehicles impacted by this rule. The Air Resources Board also has an enforcement division that can do audits on vehicle fleets. It can issue citations, and it is also working with the EPA to enforce the rule for those coming from outside California. Mike, um, after the fall of Kabul, you were on this program and you correctly forecast that the Taliban knew where Al Qaeda's leader was inside Afghanistan. Right. Um, so I'm wondering what your thought is about where the emerging terror threat is now. Right. So one of the major affiliates of Al Qaeda, it's called Al Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, the leader of that group, the deputy of that group, and the top recruiter of that group are today in Afghanistan. So Al Qaeda is, is a problem that needs to be watched in Afghanistan. The bigger problem in, Af in Afghanistan at the moment is ISIS. And ISIS you know, almost weekly attacks inside Afghanistan. The biggest worry is that they are increasingly recruiting from neighboring countries. And those individuals, particularly Tajikistan, those individuals are coming in where they're getting training from ISIS. And the concern is that they might leave Afghanistan, go back to their home countries and conduct attacks against Western interests. Think embassies. Mm -hmm. um, the, bigger, the bigger terrorism problem is actually in Africa, all the way from Somalia, all the way to, to, to West Africa, where you've got both Al Qaeda affiliates and you've got ISIS affiliates. They have control huge swaths of territory. Um, they've conducted primarily local attacks so far, but at some point, Western embassies, Western military bases in both Africa and possibly in Europe could become targets. And if we're going to make a prediction for 2023, I'd say we're going to see a terrorist attack against a Western interest somewhere in the world. Well, that's terrifying. Um, it's sobering. It's a reminder that declaring victory was too early. Terrorism has always waxed and waned. It has always gone up and down, and I think it's it's starting to bounce back. Dubai unveils the concept of a 20-minute city. Residents will be able to travel to destinations within 20 minutes by foot or bicycle. The initiative intends to beautify urban areas and reduce the carbon footprint. The 20-minute city will be divided into four centers, sector center, district center, community center, and neighborhood center. Each sector will feature different amenities such as a co-working hub, shopping center, hospital, smart police station, school etc. About 55% of the residents will be placed within 800 meters of mass transit stations. High density areas will have connected pathways for pedestrians and soft mobility. The project is part of the Dubai 2040 Urban Master Plan by Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, ruler of Dubai. Let the world hear about your brand through Channel I Am. 
But wokeism now is still alive. Well, I have two little clips here. I just want to read the headlines on it because the epidemic is still out there, but it's an academic of the spread of wokeism. And uh, unfortunately, enough people haven't awakened enough to say enough is enough. Let's this, uh, this quit this nonsense. Here's one, two of them from the Zero Hedge, which does a very good job in keeping many people up to date. Norwegian actress faces three years in prison for saying men can't be lesbians. Now that's, that's important. I wonder if that's on uh, the speaker's agenda to try to solve that. But I think this stuff uh, is stuff, it's junk. And sometimes even to debate it, you know, philosophically is uh, not a good idea because it's so, so extreme, it should be mocked. That's what it deserves. And the other one isn't much better. This is the British. The British woman arrested for silently praying near an abortion clinic. Now, that's, that's really brilliant, you know. But they, we're, we've done that stuff in this country already where they've, you know, just the cancellations. You know, you said this, how many people on the Internet get canceled? And, of course, we're hoping, our fingers crossed, that Musk is going to really, uh, you know, introduce and reintroduce the principles of uh, respect for uh, freedom of speech. Even when you say something that is controversial, this whole idea of the First Amendment, it wasn't, it wasn't made, uh, you know, just for, uh, it wasn't made just to protect uh, weather reports. Yeah. Uh, it was made to protect you to say, controversial things, especially those issues where you are criticizing the government. Welcome to the year 2023, an absolutely critical time for humanity. We are at a juncture and we are deciding the future course of our species right now. Last year was an incredibly dangerous year, obviously, with the war starting in Ukraine and the global economy beginning to collapse. But it was also a very powerful year for humanity's understanding of the way the world really works and the mass awakening. And of course, I'm talking about the fact that all of us that refused the shot, all of us that pointed out that it attacks the immune system, all of us that showed the scientific evidence that it was connected to myocarditis and blood clots have been totally vindicated. And now even members of the CDC and NIH and others are coming out and being forced to admit that. Now, the sad part about that is they are still moving forward, attempting to give these shots to six month olds and up. They're trying to make a mandatory in school. They're trying to make everybody that visits the United States take the shots before they can get here. We're the only country in the world now still doing that. We're the only country in the world that gives these shots to six month olds and up. And they're also trying to give it now to newborns. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us here when we deal with medical freedom and our bodily autonomy. But regardless, we had major breakthroughs and the whole enemy propaganda system and the, the, the federal control of big tech and everything they threw at us was not enough to suppress the truth from getting out. And it's been our viewers and listeners that have been at the very, very tip of the spear with that fight. And it's been my broadcast to the grace of God was able to have some of these top scientists on first to magnify their voices so that now in the year 2023, we have a real chance of bringing these Joseph Mingala 2.0s like Anthony Fauci to justice through the court system with our criminal investigations that have now been launched in Florida. Uh, Germany's launching a criminal investigation and a lot more is happening. So I just want to say I really appreciate all of you out there and, and the hard work you've done to tell the truth. And I want to encourage you all to redouble your efforts or they're going to try to bring back more force injections, more lockdowns, and more. Again, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all at Infowars.com. Tomorrow's news today. And as we see a new leading variant in COVID cases, CDC numbers showing only 34% of eligible people, though, have the most up-to-date booster. Madison Kimbrough spoke with a doctor who specializes in vaccines, along with people on the strip about their thoughts on the most recent booster and if they feel it's necessary. I've had COVID twice and uh, my nose got stuffy and it was gone after like a week. So I've not been boosted. I don't think it's uh, necessary. Really. Whether it's the common cold, the flu, or COVID, tis the season for getting sick. And while many out there are dealing with some sort of illness, many have decided not to get additional vaccines to protect themselves. 
According to the CDC, 63% of residents living in the Las Vegas area are fully vaccinated, while only 26% are boosted. Since 2021, there have been three boosters released. Dr. Jonathan Bakhtari, CEO of E7 Health, says he has his own theories on why the boosters are less popular. You already took you know, two, three vaccines, you got COVID. Uh, it's hard to convince someone to then go get a booster, uh, especially a booster that doesn't cover the current strains. The CDC says 80% of the population is partially vaccinated within the U.S., with 68% being fully vaccinated. Mark Jones sharing with 8 News Now that the only reason he got vaccinated was because it was mandatory for work. Jones doesn't think a booster will keep him from getting COVID in the future. I didn't mind getting the, the first initial. Um, I had to for work anyways to keep my job. But uh, after that and looking around at all the people that continue to get it that still have and that keep passing away that even have the boosters, ain't no sense of getting no more. That was Madison Kimber reporting more data on the new XBB15. Latest estimates from the CDC show it is now the leading variant in these new COVID cases, nearly doubling its percentage share of all cases. That's across the country. Uh, the week heading into Christmas, it was at 21%. Projections for this past week are up to 40%. Though hospitalizations are up just slightly, experts don't believe this variant carries a greater danger really than any others. And the same prevention measures are encouraged. In the past two weeks alone, she's fielded five calls from clients seeking help in ending their own life. So people are so desperate, they're coming here for food, but then they're asking you about assisted suicide? Yes. That's, you're having people ask you yes. about assisted suicide? Yes, yes. I, when I say that this is an emergency in the community, people who are living at the bottom income percentile in our community are talking to us now about taking their own lives because it's too hard to be poor any longer. Uh, last week's visitor log release showed a most recent meeting between Sam Bankman-Fried and a White House official, Steve Ricchetti. In this case, this was his fourth meeting of the year. I'm wondering, uh, I'm giving this the first briefing since then, if you can give us any sort of summary of what has been discussed in Mr. Bankman Fried's meetings with the White House over the course of the year? Yeah, so let me uh, give you a couple of a couple of uh, a few rundowns here. Um, so uh, as we've pre previously confirmed, as you know, I know you're following this very closely, these meetings included uh, Steve Reschetti and Bruce Reed. Uh, the meetings focused on pandemic prevention related to uh, Sam Bankman Fried's foundation and general information on the cryptocurrency industry and crypto exchanges. Look, you know, uh, the administration has been clear about the need for Congress to take action when it when we talk about addressing uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, the president, as you know, released uh, an executive order on this topic just last March. And the president released a framework for protecting consumers last fall and last November, Secretary Yellen renewed this administration's call for Congress to take action. So, uh, you know, as you know, the, the White House regularly engages uh, with officials from a range of industries and sectors, including leaders uh, in business and labor and nonprofits. Uh, you know, uh, again, this meeting uh, with um, Sam Bankman Fried uh, was uh, focused on pandemic prevention uh, related matters and uh, cryptocurrency and uh, crypto exchanges. The conversation around vaccinations has changed dramatically over the last couple of years. A new study shows it's having an impact on parents and how they think about school required vaccinations. Teresa Priolo explains what's behind the shift in thinking. As a physician, particularly pediatric infectious disease physician, uh, who sees children who get sick with vaccine preventable diseases in the hospital, um, simply because they were exposed to someone else who has gotten this disease, um, we know that vaccines can basically work to protect a population. It's always been a basic tenet in pediatric care, sticking to the immunization schedule, which includes the annual flu shot. Now that seems to be changing. Parents taking matters and medicine into their own hands. A lot of parents have come to me lately and said, I've always gotten vaccines, I've always trusted you, but now I'm starting to lose trust, I think, in the medical community. It's really unfortunate, but... 
Prior to this, I've never had parents question anything. A new survey published by the Kaiser Family Foundation showed more than a third of U.S. parents believe vaccinating their children against long eradicated illnesses like measles, mumps, rubella should be an individual choice, not a requirement to attend public school. That's a noticeable uptick post pandemic, especially among diseases like polio or measles that are highly contagious and incredibly dangerous. If you put 10 people in a room, and one of those people have me has measles. If they are um, basically just in the room, they don't even really have to cough or sneeze, but it, it helps if they cough or sneeze in that room. Um, seven to eight of those people out of those 10 will get infected with measles. No one knows for sure why this is happening, but one theory might be based on the COVID vaccine and the intense pressure to get the shot during the initial stages of the vaccine rollout. A lot of parents have lost trust because it's being shoved down their throat. It's a blanket statement of you need to get this as opposed to, well, you don't have to get this, but I'd recommend it and here's why. We've lost the conversation. We've lost any... Uh, ability to go back and forth and talk to parents about this. As it stands, all 50 states and D.C. require public school children to be vaccinated against certain diseases. Few exceptions are allowed. Right now, that does include the flu, but not COVID. There's no telling if that could change. Teresa Priolo, Fox 5 News. I've traveled over 140 countries around the world. As I was, the, I'll paraphrase the phrase in my old neighborhood. The rest of the countries, the world's not a patch on our genes. If we do what we want to do, we need to do. Low traffic neighborhoods have now been turned into, or will be turned into, 15 minute neighborhoods. Alan Miller's here, there's a big protest coming up this weekend. Alan, tell us uh, what you're doing first of all, and tell us uh, what insidiousness are you fighting? The low traffic neighborhoods, many of which came in during lockdown, many didn't get uh, invitations to the consultations, many people were not online. Those that did overwhelmingly rejected the idea that we should have them, although the councils have decided that that is not relevant. They're not interested in the democratic process. They're pushing ahead anyway. The 15 minute city that Oxford is promoting goes a another step further. You should be walking and cycling, sort of mandating behavior, mm. preventing vans from dropping things off for businesses, hospitality suffering enormously. If everybody in Britain was saying this is what we should have, that would be something different. But we're being presented with this net zero notion that then ends up limiting us, restricting us, uh, locking down areas of our lives and cities and streets, which people have said they don't want. So on Saturday in Haringey, residents and businesses are going to be out there challenging what's going on with Haringey Council, saying they don't want it. It's impacting people, families and businesses negatively and together have signatures and members both residents and businesses in all the boroughs in the UK. It's about the public having our voices heard, being listened to when we actually do consultations. And actually, where did it become the case where we could suddenly have all our streets cordoned off a bit like East Berlin was? Mm. I mean, it's kind of ludicrous and no one's agreed to it. And I think that the councillors and government as well should think very carefully now because a lot of people are furious. People are losing their incomes. They're not able to see loved ones. The cars always represented some independence for people, some yeah. freedom. And that is one of the things that's abhorrent for technocrats who like to sort of suffocate and limit. If people want to join the protest, Alan, uh, what can they do? Is there a place they can go and find where it is? Yeah, so it's on Saturday at 2 p.m. in Wood Green, outside the View Cinemas. Uh, you can also go to togetherdeclaration.org. Uh, uh, where we've got information there and at Together Deck on our Twitter. And we'd love people to join us and get involved with it. And those in our most, the most vulnerable in our communities. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Australian cities are becoming digital surveillance precincts with so-called smart city programs being rolled out across the country. Invasive technology such as facial recognition cameras, license plate readers, smart lights, smart poles, smart cars, smart neighbourhoods, smart homes and smart appliances all connected to wireless networks and communicating with each other. So what's wrong with that? Technology is good, isn't it? All this is for your safety, security and convenience, isn't it? Well, let me tell you, your streets are spying on you, your mobile phone is spying on you, your cities are spying on you and the infrastructure for future lockdowns is being put into place right now. Don't be fooled. You're being set up to be tracked through your movements and through the future of your digital wallets. 
By handing over your data, you're handing over the ability to monitor your behaviour, which will soon be turned into a social credit score. And once the central bank digital currencies are in place, you won't get to spend your money without approval. Digital ID will soon become a reality in Australia. Many other countries are already rolling these systems out, countries like Canada, Scotland and many others. Eventually, you won't be able to access any government or public services and you won't be able to travel across borders or access health care or the internet without a digital ID. Think you won't comply? I think you will. The last two years were the dress rehearsal and we fell for it hook, line and sinker. Australians are sleepwalking into this technocratic future. And while we're sitting around, scratching our chins, trying to work out whether this is really happening, Australia is drifting towards a dystopian digital future. If you need a single location to get cutting edge information and keep up with the rapidly changing world around us, tune into Grand Theft World, where a forensic historian and a logic professor break down the week's news in depth and in context. There's a ton more there, so go check it out. And don't forget to get your Freedom Vault on the homepage.